Ago, Ago, Midasi. Some West African Fonte on this Sunday afternoon. Just saying attention, please, and thank you very much. Hoping everybody is doing your absolute best, achieving the highest level of mental, physical, and spiritual strength and well being that is possible. We are really glad that you are here choosing to spend this hour with us. And we look forward to uh, sharing this topic with you, very important topic, um, dealing with uh, growing up in this backward society, raising children with revolutionary consciousness and practice. That's the discussion topic for today. And we're gonna talk about how Shakura was, and many other children, um, especially within the All African People's Revolutionary Party, foundation because that was the foundation that we functioned in. Um, all of the children were raised in very similar fashion. Um, and so we're going to share some of those things, some of the really positive things that we think came out of that, that hopefully can help you, um, you know, because people are always saying, well, we, we need to, we need to go get the youth. We need to raise the youth, but no one really, there isn't really anywhere that I see where that's being laid out. Like these are some best practices and trying to raise youth with healthy perspectives in a backward society where money's more important than people. So that's really gonna be our focus today. And we start as we always do, giving respect and acknowledgement to the indigenous people of the Western hemisphere. Um, I'm here in Miwok uh, people's land. And it's important that we always never forget that this land was stolen from those people. It was violently and viciously stolen from them and they are fighting to get their land back. They're not fighting for more casinos or more stores. They're fighting to get their land back. This backward US government has offered them money multiple times for a number of broken treaties. The Fort Laramie Treaty, for example, always comes to mind. That's where the Dakotas were stolen from the indigenous people. The Pahasapa, or what you, what you probably know as Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. And they offer them money for that, the Lakota people, and they consistently turn it down because they know that their people suffering can never have a price tag on it. They want the land back. That's what they want. And Africans in the U.S., there's a lesson to be learned because some of us here are, are advocating for a check to be cut for 529 years of suffering, not even understanding fully the extent of damage that has been done against our people all over the world because of the last 529 years, willing to sell that out for $10,000 or whatever these thugs offer you. And that's a disgrace for you. If you believe that, that's a disgrace. You can't put a price tag on suffering and there's no negotiating with terrorists. So we honor the indigenous people of the Western hemisphere. And because we do not negotiate with terrorists, we honor our African ancestors. And the first way that we honor them is we would never sell them out. We would never sell out their suffering. They suffered, they took beatings so that you and I could be here today. From the Eastern shores of Africa, the Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, all the way to the west shores of Africa, across the continent, the Sudan, Chad, the Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, all the way to the west coast of the Gulf of Guinea, to Ghana, the Cote d'Ivoire, to Togo, to Senegal, to Guinea-Bissau, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to this entire Western hemisphere from Alaska down to Chile in South America. Our people took beatings, took murder so that you and I could be here today. And I don't think they did that so that you could get a, some money deposited in your checking account. That's not what that was about. It was about them understanding that our people have to be free. And the only way we're gonna be free is by going up against this backward system that put us in this position and keeps us in this position. And so that means that's our reparations. Our reparations is reclaiming our mother Africa. That's the reparations. Africa has all we need. All the money you're trying to get from them, they stole it from Africa. So we get Africa back. We don't need them anymore for anything. So this is what we're here to do when we say we honor our ancestors, y'all. 
and we're going to continue to do that. And so we're glad you're here for this topic because we cannot have revolution unless we have revolutionaries. And revolutionaries have to be socialized, they have to be groomed, they have to be supported and nurtured. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And we'll do that, we'll start with uh, quick introductions as always. My name is Ajamu, and I am an all longtime organizer for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, I've been able to do work all over the world for the party and will continue to do so for as long as I have breath in which to do it. And with me, as always, every week is my wonderful daughter and my only child. If anyone says any different, they're lying. I only have one, Shakura. Shakur grew up in the All African People's Revolutionary Party and is now a PhD student. That, that was supposed to be humor. You know, people, you know, everything I say, people take literally, so I gotta remember that. But, um, oh, he got other kids. Um, no, no other kids, only Shakur. She grew up in the All African People's Revolutionary Party's Young Pioneer Institute program. And now she participates in the APRP while finishing up her PhD studies. She will be the first person in our family to achieve that objective. And a wonderful activist and organizer. Um, we were on the phone on a, one of our party calls yesterday and talked to her afterwards about it. And we were on before this and we do that all day every week and just really enjoy being able to have a positive relationship with my only child. And we'll continue to prioritize that. And then going back to the party, the objective of the All African People's Revolutionary Party is Pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa, one unified socialist Africa. And if you want to know what that looks like, the book on the right, Kwame Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, is a book that lays out the strategy of uniting all of the Pan-African formations on the ground in Africa into one fighting body. And you see logos there of many of the organizations that we work with who are on the ground in various parts of Africa. If you missed African Liberation Day, you really missed something, you should go to YouTube and check out the video because all of these organizations were participating. There's statements from the Democratic Party of Guinea, a keynote address from the African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau, the PAIGC, um, presentations by the Milkar Cabral Ideological School, and then we supported African Liberation Day events on the ground in Azania, or what you call South Africa, Zimbabwe, in Kenya, in Senegal, Ghana, and we will continue, and Guinea-Bissau, of course, and we will continue to build up this work. And we have chapters all over the world in relationship with non-African liberation movements um, who are fighting for justice against the same enemy that we're fighting for. So we're just real happy to have you with us today. And to get us started, we will open it up with Shukura. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Daddy. I really appreciate that. And I hope that you all continue to be in as best mind, body, and spirit as you can be. Uh, I was really excited to kind of open up to you today and talk a little bit more about who I am and how my parents came to, I guess, mold me to be the person that I am. So without further ado, I wanna start off by talking about how my parents realized very quickly and accepted the fact that a capitalist system has all day throughout school, television, social interactions with our friends when we're children and even as we get older, to help us understand that it's all about making money and profit. So many times, if you are one of those parents who is deciding to be in a resistance of that, then I think you're on the right track. But my parents were already clear that that wasn't something that they wanted to support. And they wanted to work very hard to go against that as much as they could. So they made the decision to develop and implement a plan that would help balance out all the interactions that I received from capitalist media to all the Pan-Africanism information and knowledge that I would receive as well. I remember attending all types of meetings related to the AAPRP. We traveled many times throughout my childhood to college campuses, which is where a majority of AAPRP recruitment took place. And at those meetings, one of the comrades, because they would take turns and alternate, would take the Young Pioneer Institute or YPI as known in the party 
uh, task of looking after the children. So we had different types of activities that we would participate in while our parents were in the larger meeting. We had pages that had African leaders on them and we had coloring books and different crowns and whatnot to color and become familiar with these images and these names. We would talk about these people and what they did. I specifically, my mom just sent me a picture that she found because she keeps everything because she's awesome of a, a photograph that I colored of Marcus Garvey and Asada Shakur, just to give you an example. So, you know, for children who are four or five and six who don't know who those people are, it's a really great way to help them interact by giving them a crown because most children love to color and then helping them talk about who that person is at the same time. We also had the opportunity to color the continent of Africa, which was really important because that allowed us to start learning the names of the countries and to start identifying where they are from a geographical and regional standpoint. And I remember that we had games to help us remember the names and to learn the geography. We also had songs that we sang when we were in YPI. So daddy, I don't know if you remember this, I'm sure you do, but we had a song and I'll sing a little bit. I am a horrible singer, but a little bit. And it goes something like this. A is for Africa, the land of my home. B is for the bravery, which our people have shown. C is for the continent, and so you get the idea. So instead of doing your typical ABCs, you're giving a different text to how we use letters and then how we use letters to remember what it is that we really need to remember, which is unlearning the systems of oppression that are teaching us lies and teaching our children lies. So I was also taught that lesson and reinforced it tremendously that I was African. I never was allowed to say African-American. I never wanted to say African-American. I never heard my parents say that growing up. So it was foreign to me to hear other people that I knew were African say African-American. We also didn't use the term black growing up. So just little things like that, just constant reinforcements. And I, I promise you, I'm not just exaggerating. I literally didn't even use the term home quote, because if I did, it was automatically in direct relationship to motherland Africa. It was never to talk about Sacramento. It was never to talk about America. So our, our family didn't say, oh, you know, well, we have pizza at home. We, we didn't say, oh, it's time to go home. We never used those terms because we always knew that they were in reference to Africa. And if one of us did slip up because we were conditioned by capitalism daily, so we did have slip ups, then the other three, other two people would remind that person, oh, are you going home tonight? Because you're going to have to get on a, a lot of different ships and some planes to fly all the way back to Africa. So we're going to talk a little bit more later tonight about the importance of consistency, but that's just one example of that. Is you know, like once you take a stand on something, if you don't stand for it, you'll fall for anything, right? So that's why it's important to take a stand and then to literally stand by and be committed to what it is you're standing for because that's how you develop character with yourself, with your children. And I'll talk more about how that builds self-esteem and other things like that, because you're showing them what it means to stand up. So I just wanna make that clear that my parents would redirect me if I had any type of mishap with my messaging. And then I also wanna make sure that we talk about the fact that our family was based on love, honesty, and those were our values. We never focused on material things. When I was younger, children would tease me, yes, for my name being different. And because I did not have the latest Jordans, Nikes, or designer jeans, they would tease me for those things too. I did struggle with that. So I'm not going to tell you that I didn't have issues growing up and I didn't understand why I was different from other kids. I, I struggled with all of those things. And to some extent, because of white supremacy, I still struggle with them today. However, I was constantly reminded and redirected that there's a reason why material things are not important. There's a reason for that. So it wasn't just, why can't I have these genes? There was an analysis that was given to me. There was an explanation that was given to me. And then there was some type of, we can meet you halfway uh, negotiation at some point because they didn't want me to just completely be exiled and they didn't want me to be completely alienated. They wanted me to understand that it's not about material things. But if you can show a way to sacrifice, if you can show a way to give someone else some of your time or energy or something else, then maybe there's a way that we can find a way for you to buy another pair of jeans. Maybe it's not that pair because that pair is a Zionist organization or whatever the case may be. And so there were often times where I would you know, try to step up, do my part around the house. But more than that, I would try to assist and help other people as well. And so I never really felt left out. And I also never really felt like I just was the weird kid on the bus, if that makes sense. So 
there was a, 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 a give and pull with that, but it was always a constant struggle. But my parents helped me understand it's not about the material things. And I think that's one of the reasons why they wanted me to go to Africa as young as I was. So I've been to Africa twice. I went when I was four to Accra, and I went when I was 16 to Dakar, Senegal, Accra, Ghana, by the way. And so that was a really like mind blowing and life changing experience, obviously, but I'm gonna give you some exact specific examples in just a second. So as I said, when I was four, I went to Accra, Ghana, and that's of course where Nkrumah was the first president, by the way. And so uh, we went back when I was 16 to Dakar, Senegal. And since we did not focus on material things, I was able to engage in organizing at home. So we literally went to organizational meetings while we were there. It wasn't just a pleasure trip where we were laying on a beach or whatever you think people do when they go to Africa. We actually had meetings and schedules that we had to attend to because we were there for a purpose. And we always are telling you all to join an organization, any organization working for justice. What better way than to be at home in Africa and to see how they organize there on the ground. And so I had firsthand experiences with that. We even, when I was four, we even witnessed Nelson Mandela being released from prison. So just a lot of different examples of how engaging that was for me, but it was really awesome to be able to work with organizations back home because then you get to see how they're doing things in Africa and then you connect it to how you see organizing happening here when I'm going to these college campuses with my parents. So, so then you start to see a connection. Even though you're six, seven or eight, nine, if you have consistency in your life, you're gonna start to draw connections to that because that's what children need is structure. And once you start to give them that foundation, they start to build on top of that and become very critical in a good way. So I thought that that was really cool. And then I also remember some things that I saw in Africa that really challenged me on a different level and helped me try to see, okay, how can I make these connections? So I started seeing the conditions of my people at home and other places because I started traveling as I got older. And then I saw the common denominator that we are oppressed and disadvantaged everywhere. We're not just oppressed and disadvantaged in Miami. We're just oppressed, we're oppressed and disadvantaged in Accra. We're oppressed and disadvantaged in Memphis. We're oppressed and disadvantaged in London, everywhere. So I was in high school and I had to catch two buses to get to school. And again, this is in Sacramento. And I always wondered why there were so many Africans catching the bus who didn't have transportation in Sacramento. And when we went to Dakar, not only did we catch the bus to go to these different meetings, so I noted that there were still many Africans without cars in Dakar, but on top of that, there were also many Africans who couldn't afford healthcare because of imperialist standards and because of their class and their income. And what I mean by that is, I remember we were just getting off a bus and I'll never forget this. I don't know if you remember this, Daddy. I'm sure you do, because how could you see something like this and not be impacted? But we were stepping off the bus and I remembered seeing a brother who was in the street, like in the road where the cars are traveling uh, to and from. And he was literally pulling himself or dragging himself um, on his stomach. And what I understood about that experience, I remembered asking my dad, you know, wh what's happening? There's something obviously going on with his spine where he can't obviously stand upright and walk on two legs. There's, there's gotta be a reason why he's pulling himself. But you could tell that there was some type of paralysis or some type of degenerative system with his spine. His spine was not functioning, whatever that looks like. And I assumed it was paralysis because again, why would a person literally pull themselves on their stomach? And so wherever this brother started off, to wherever he was going, we have to understand how much arm muscle he had to have, how much arm strength, determination, emotional strength he had to have of doing that. And I knew that it was inappropriate to stare because my parents taught me to respect all human beings, but I was so drawn to that image of just seeing him pulling himself. And I will never forget that. Never will I forget that. So because of imperialism, he doesn't even have the ability to go to a doctor to figure out maybe if there's some type of treatment where he at least has access to a wheelchair or a device where he may not have to pull himself in the street. And so sadly, that's the case with a lot of Africans. And we know that there are Africans here in the States who are struggling with paralysis and spinal issues. So again, the combination is imperialism, class and income, okay? I was encouraged to understand and accept and respect all forms of spiritual worship as well as atheism. The only requirement that was stressed on me was the need to ensure whatever I believed in, that it had to be connected to the struggle for justice and forward progress. That was my spirituality. And even to this day, I try to explain that to people and they have a hard time with that. And I know they have a hard time with that because 
a lot of the religions and spiritualities that we identify with, if they are neo-colonial, if they are capitalist, if they are patriarchal, then they're going to protect and promote those same systems of oppression. And I think that's a really deep conversation that we really have to be honest with ourselves on. Because if you truly are identifying with the spirituality, my argument is that spirituality should be making you a better person, which in theory means that you're going to use your knowledge and wealth to make the world a better place. So if, you're, if your religion or spirituality is promoting and perpetuating patriarchy, I'm not really sure how that's going to make the world a better place. I'm not sure how you would identify with the religion that thinks it's okay to be sexist or thinks that it's okay to be racist or thinks that it's okay to be homophobic. So I think, it's, again, we have to be honest with that. When I was younger, I attended all kind of religious spaces. So Islamic temples, non-denominational services. I've been to Buddhist temples. I've been to Episcopalian and Baptist and Catholic services. And to this day, I still see that my connection has to be tied to justice. It has to be tied to making sure that humanity has what they need because all people should be able to live in a world where they shouldn't have to worry about how their race, their class, or their gender is going to impact them on their life, whether it's from a health standpoint, whether it's from a financial standpoint, or whether it's from a general standpoint. There's no reason why that should be the case. And if we organize enough, we can overturn that. And then finally, instead of ignoring white supremacy and oppression as if ignoring them makes the impact less, my family taught me to confront it and address it head on. So they prepared me as best that they could. When I was growing up, I had all kinds of world maps in my house. And this is really important because a lot of times when we buy maps back, excuse me, buy maps today, we're not conscious of the fact that they are not accurately, excuse me, depicting what the world actually looks like. And what I mean by that is a lot of maps are based on white supremacy, so they're going to show you that the continent of Africa is actually smaller than it actually really is. So then you grow up thinking, right, that you see the home that you actually are from as being, quote unquote, insignificant because it's smaller. And so then you start to devalue yourself and you start to think, maybe I just need to accept my life in America because at least America is bigger and better and more money and more process and finance and resources. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. America has its hand in every single pot that it can get its hand in. Nothing that America has is based off of hard work and principle. Everything is stolen. And my dad has said that before. So I had maps in my house that accurately depicted what Africa looks like and accurately depicted what the U.S. looks like. And I think that's really important. A, because we need to know what the countries are in Africa because that is our home and we need to know our countries in our own home. And B, because you need to understand literally how much wealth and resource comes from that continent. I guarantee you, if you really start to think about that, it's going to change your self-esteem and your self-perception because you have to identify with the fact that you come from that, which means you're gonna have pride because now you understand that your, your motherland has been exploited all this time. And everything that has been taught to you has been a lie and it's gonna start to change your trajectory on what you're thinking about. So the maps were really important and you have to be clear about buying a certain map so that you can accurately depict that. And then you also need to think about other ways that white supremacy can show its ugly head. So my dad and I talked about me using this example about straightening my hair growing up. And I don't wanna lose any of the viewers who think that straightening their hair or perming their hair is the way to go. I understand the struggle. I'm here to tell you that even to this day, I understand the struggle. And if you don't believe me, you can talk offline with me and we can have a conversation. But I do think it's important to give this example because again, even though I deal with this as a person in my thirties, when I was younger, it was even harder for me because I was at a, at a point where when I was younger, yes, my parents would do my hair. But as I got older, of course, I wanted to follow my friends and follow media and follow all these celebrities that had long flowing hair because I knew nothing about weaves at that time. I just thought that that was their hair. And what is the beauty standard that we're all taught based on white supremacy, that long flowing hair is the way to go. Nappy curly hair is not beautiful at all. That's the media narrative that we're taught. And so when you're 16 and you're trying to figure out why the boy is not talking to you and why he didn't invite you to come to the dance, you're starting to question yourself. You're starting to critique yourself and you're starting to believe that you are not beautiful enough. But maybe if you straighten your hair, maybe it might be a different situation. And so I struggled begging my parents <laughs> to allow me to straighten my hair. And I, I lost the battle. I did not win the war. I lost all of it. My mom was extremely adamant against that and refused to allow me to understand why that was important to me. 
she instead wanted me to focus on learning more skills about myself so that I could start to style my hair in different ways. Uh, she did take me to my aunt who was a stylist at the time. And so that helped my self-esteem and whatnot. But my point is we have to be uncomfortable sometimes when it means resisting it because she helped me explain those curls, those curls in that nap is what makes you, you. And once you identify with someone else's definition of you, then you're not you anymore. And why wouldn't you want to be you? What is it about you that you don't like and identify with? Because you are beautiful. And why are you allowing someone else to set that beauty standard for you? So again, not knocking anyone who chooses to straighten their perm. I completely understand why, because it's a struggle, as I have said before. But when I was younger, and even as a young woman now, I still try to work on that because I do feel like I would be disrespecting my ancestors because these curls are what make me who I am. And even though I struggle with it every day, because as soon as you turn on the commercial, it's a different story. But just think about that. And if we have questions, I'll, I'll try to look at the chat when I take a break and hand it back over to my dad. And then last but not least, and we'll change the slide, I just want to also talk about how we have to make sure that we're continuing to make this idea of learning about Africa and learning about ourselves fun. So on different opportunities, I've traveled with both of my parents. My dad and I drove me out here and my mom flew out and met us here. And then I traveled across four states with my mom and both times we started making up games so that we could keep our Pan-Africanism up and well because that was entertaining to us. So my mom and I had this game where we were trying to think of different, um, different uh, people born outside of the US who would be considered African comrades. So you couldn't name people who were born in the US who did work for the struggle. You could only name people outside of the US. And unfortunately that was really challenging because I don't, I couldn't really think of a lot of people, especially when she said, okay, you, now you can name women identifying people who've been born outside of the US who have contributed to the African struggle. So just really taking it to the next level, which means doing some research and actually learning about new names that you may not be already familiar with. And then when my dad and I were driving across to Memphis, I had an African trivia card set. So I was pulling out cards and asking him questions and then he was asking me questions. And then again, we tried to see how many countries we can name just off the top of our head without looking at our phones, okay? So just different things that you can do to unlearn what lies have been taught and then also to reclaim what's yours and that's your history. Next slide. Okay, so the objective cannot be perfection because that's unachievable. Our family objective was consistency. This is so important, you all. They wanted to make sure that I saw that they were making every effort to live a principled life. I experienced structure and discipline upbringing with my parents. We had patterns, routines that enabled me to feel familiar with terms such as Pan-Africanism, socialism. They were saying these terms to me literally as a four-year-old talking to me about socialism, okay? Capitalism and attending party or work study meetings. To this day, when I speak to my friends about systems of oppression, I'm sure they think, oh, Shukor, you are always on that African stuff. Yes, I am. But the truth is, I continue to develop an analysis. So I learn more, I grow more, and I evolve more. And I'm noting that other people are doing the same thing. As other people start to learn, learn more about socialism, there's all these different socialist organizations now. And resisting oppression, they may start to come around. But I always try to help people understand that they need to join in organization, even if it's not the APRP, because if you have to explain in 30 seconds or less why people are oppressed, the bottom line is that poor people do not matter in this world. That's the bottom line. And so the best way to help poor people matter is to help them organize so that they can turn over the same oppressor that is oppressing them. And so at least people are organizing if they are in an organization that is working for justice. I was raised to put people above money in terms of how we interact and treat people. So specifically service workers. And I really appreciated that foundation from my parents because in seeing the value of custodians and not living my life as if I am higher than others, it allowed me to really think about our positionality and how we all matter. My parents helped me understand that by propping up all positions, and drawing out the social drawbacks if we lacked custodians or sanitation workers was vital for our society to function. And if you were not on our first couple of seminars, my dad gave the example of just what would happen if you went three days without the sanitation worker coming to pick up the trash in your neighborhood. Just think of all the infestations, all the rats and raccoons and all these different critters who would come out because they would be attracted by all of that. 
So it's fascinating to me that we honor doctors more and we don't honor sanitation workers when I legit try to nod at them when they drive through my apartment complex because I'm grateful for that. Because I don't want to have to smell that if it gets too backed up after a while. So those are just real things that we need to think about. We need to make sure we appreciate them and actually tell them thank you. That's what I do. I'm not just speaking out the side of my neck. I legit, when I go to the store and I see people wiping off the chairs, I legit say, thank you for doing that. And they look at me like I'm strange and an alien, but they don't have to do that. And they don't have to take it seriously and they don't have to work as hard as they're working. So just trying to be humanist and trying to show appreciation, you'd be surprised how far that goes. And then last point for this slide, we have to have healthy boundaries. My parents never forced a commitment on me to join the AAPRP or any organization. They did tell me that I had to make a contribution and they respected my ability to figure out my faith and commitment to my people based on my experiences. I actually took this literally to be true. And to this day, I wake up each day as I embody what I think my ancestors would want me to do. And I try desperately to do that justice for them. I take that very seriously. I'm constantly thinking about children, excuse me, that have not been born yet. And maybe that explains my connection to doulas and maternity care. And so I'm thinking about these children who haven't been born and ways that I can help make this world better for them before they get here because they don't have to deal with this mess. And I don't want them to have to deal with this mess. I want to enhance the world and make it better for children so that when they come, they can have better conditions and hopefully have a better chance of living a more healthier world. Next slide. Okay, so we have to think about how we wanna normalize standing up for what's right, regardless of the consequences. We can't just tell our children to do something and then contradict that as soon as our children are faced with the challenge or when we as adults are faced with the challenge to do that because that discredits us and the values that we want to represent. This is really, really important you all because helping your children understand how critical the value of word and action to back up the word is is a missing link in this world today. And if you are unsure about that, just think about how we used to teach ourselves that your word is your bond, but there's so many people who go against their word all the time. And so how do you develop credibility? How do you develop respect? And most importantly, how do you join an organization if you yourself are not credible or if the person leading the organization is not credible? That's gonna make you reevaluate why you're joining that organization, which really slows down the struggle if you really wanna be honest about it. And we don't really have time for that. So we have to make sure that we start to practice consistency and commitment. And then we need to make sure we're showing our children that as well. To this day, I choose to write about African women identifying people and their struggles with labor agency and reaching optimal health. And I write about that in every space that I can write about that in. I have one published article and one published chapter in a book that both focus on African women identifying people and systems of oppression, trying to prevent them from living healthy lives and having healthy pregnancies. When given an opportunity to write papers in my courses in college, I always chose to write about African women identifying people and will continue to write about us. I try to use my platform to dismantle lies and explain and address how capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy are all malicious attempts to disable women identifying people to be healthy. The world needs to know the truth and African women identifying deserve justice. And as I continue to think about that, that means in any space that you have the opportunity to stand up for yourself, you should try to do that. So even if you are in a college course and you hear a professor say something that is inaccurate, it might be scary because you're worried about your grade or the outcome of the class, but I think specifically, especially if you're pursuing a graduate degree, that's your job is to be critical. Your job is not to just accept what information is handed to you on a platter. So I've been in spaces where the instructor was extremely racist and said crazy stuff about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment that I knew wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true because I had done my proper political education research, but beyond that, I attended Tuskegee University. I've been to the building where the syphilis experiment took place, took classes in there, and had to do orientation and read books on it. So not only have I met heirs of people who have had, who have had people participate in the study, but I have a more better working knowledge of it than this instructor. So when they said stuff that wasn't true, I felt like it was a diss to all our African ancestors who died from syphilis. And I spoke up about it <laughs> and she had a problem with that, but I still passed the class with an A because you couldn't refute what I said. I, I broke it down and I gave the analysis and I had evidence to support what I was saying. 
So as long as you are consistent, as long as you are letting people know, you know what you're talking about. And more than anything, you're standing up for what's right, because that wouldn't be right to just let this person diss these African ancestors when they went through all of that and were lied and all the stuff that went through for that. That's not OK. By the same token, you have to stand up for your children. And we mean against capitalist institutions. So whether it's school, healthcare, whatever, resist having them pledge the allegiance if the pledge goes against your values. My dad talked about this two weeks ago. If you don't want your kids to do the Pledge of Allegiance, you have a right as their parent to write a letter up and send it to the school, send it to every teacher that that teacher would need to be impacted by so that they know that is not something that you believe in. Especially if it's a public school, they can't resist that because you're the parent and you can decide to pull them out and then they lose money. So they might want to work with you because everything is driven on money. But you have a right to speak up against that. You need to write a letter to let them know that's not okay. And of course you need to explain to your child first that this is the step you're gonna take and this is why you want your child to be consistent with it. But you have every right to do that and just be consistent with it. That also means that you don't pledge the flag in public spaces. So if you're writing a letter to the child's teacher, then that means when you go to the next NBA game, once everybody is vaccinated and you can sit six feet from the other person, don't stand up when they say, and now we're gonna honor the flag, be consistent. Regardless, every single space where you have an opportunity to um, abandon your values, don't bite the bait. Don't take it. Don't bite the bait. Any public spaces where they, it's a sporting event, whatever, and they are honoring the flag, you need to do what you need to do to hold true to your principles. My dad and I are very creative in what we do, <laughs> but we don't, we don't salute that because we don't believe in that. And if I did salute that, I would feel disgusted and I would feel like my ancestors would reject me. And when I die, I don't want them to reject me. I want them to welcome me with open arms because that means I actually did something and made the world better. So be consistent with that and make sure your children notice that you're being consistent. Don't let your children observe you sacrificing their dignity or your own for anybody. Don't let them witness that because that is going to damage their self-esteem and their self-efficacy. Instead, we wanna work on enhancing their self-esteem and their self-efficacy. We wanna make sure they understand with your demonstration that you are giving them consent to stand up for themselves. The only reason I had the courage to talk back to my college instructor was because I've seen my parents do it repeatedly. And I knew that as long as I had evidence and an analysis to support what I was saying, she couldn't refute my argument. But it's only because my parents have shown me it's okay to stand up against systems of oppression, especially racism. And that was a clear example of that. So show your children how to do that and give them consent to do it as long as they do it in a, in a, you know, a humanist way where they can, again, show an analysis of some type, allow them to know that it's okay. The systems that we currently live in don't encourage us to speak up. We're just supposed to be little pods and just go in our houses and our, you know, mini coops and drive in our driveway and cut our grass the same way like we would do if we were living in a leave it to beaver uh, timeline. But that's not, that's not realistic and that's certainly not going to help us get free and win the revolution. So this enhances your self-esteem and gives your children a chance to build their self-esteem and their self-efficacy. And then also with parents, when they're able to show their children that they are standing up, it allows them, the parents, to start to build self-efficacy and self-esteem because we can't just assume that just because we're adults, we have all our stuff together. Some of us are broken because the system has worked very hard to let us know that we are not worth a darn. So we have to work to build our own selves up so that we can instead show our children how to do that as well. And remember, we are the best models for our children. If we legit love our children and want them to be successful, we are the best models for them because we are actually going to be truthful and tell them what's going on. We are not going to lie to them, unlike many other entities in their life. And they need to witness that we're being consistent with our values so that that's how we build character and trust among one another as well. Okay. And then last but not least, we need to normalize discussing everything with our children. So that means developing the expectation that this can and will happen. No limit. If you don't talk to them, who will? And I'll just leave with one final example and I'll turn it back over to my dad. I'll never forget when that movie with Tyrese, Baby Boy came out. <laughs> okay, so some of y'all remember that, which means you know how old I am. So the movie came out. I really wanted to see it, but I couldn't see it because my parents had you know, values where they didn't want me watching things at other people's houses without their knowledge and they were clear to understand, okay, if that's what's going to happen there, then you don't need to go to that slumber party. So legit having conversations with other people so you can know what kind of spaces your child is gonna be in. So I didn't go to other people's house and watch the movie. And I remembered coming back to my dad's house because my parents were divorced. 
And he asked me, do you want to watch the movie? And I said, yes, I've been trying to watch it for like five weeks now. Yes, I would love to watch it. And he said, okay, well, if we watch it, you know, just understand I'm going to be pausing it from time to time to explain to you what's happening. And I can't remember, I think I was a preteen, I can't remember, but I didn't, I was like, oh, we don't have to pause it, we could just watch it. But he was trying to do that to help me understand, okay, at this moment, this is why Tyrese's character is doing this. Do you understand that that was an example of sexism? Do you understand that was an example of abuse? Do you understand that was an example of self-hatred? Like just whatever the, the context of the film was, my dad was pausing it to help pinpoint it for me and to explain it to me, including the parts where people took their clothes off. I'm not gonna say too much because there might be children on tonight, but including those parts, he explained that to me. Because if you don't explain it to them, as the, as the bullet said, who else is gonna explain it to them? And what's worse, do we want our children to learn it from some untrustworthy source or do we wanna try to give them a frame that they can understand because we've been able to articulate it the way we think they need to hear it, but also in a way that makes sense to them as opposed to them learning it from who knows what source and, and still having questions that may be unanswered, which doesn't help them draw an analysis later. And again, we want them to be critical. We want them to be thinking about things and be analyzing things. And we want them to push back against systems that don't make sense because they're based on lies and untruths. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Chakora. Thank you very much for sharing you know, your, uh, that, that, that's critically important to, to share what your experiences are, because I think it's, it's going to be a lot different than what people are experiencing. And I'm just going to wrap it up by just going through uh, what we would call some keys to remember of the things that you've said. Um, and the first thing, just reiterate, because you can't say this enough, honest discussions with your children, talking to your children about everything. Now, I'm, I'm not, I'll be, never be confused as someone who's perfect, but one mistake that I do not make is Shakura can tell you, like she knows all the strengths that I have and all the errors that I've made in my life. And I'm very, I, I try to be very honest about that. And I do that because I cannot expect to talk to her about what kind of person I want her to be if I'm not willing to demonstrate what that type of person should look like. And that means creating narratives where strength is not being able to never appear as if you're in pain or suffering. Strength is being able to get knocked down, acknowledge you got knocked down and get back up. Whether you're talking about physically or spiritually, whatever way it is, get back up and keep going. And so it was important to us, her mom and I to struggle with her to understand that and then to demonstrate that through our what we did so you know we might have fell short in a lot of ways but we were never hypocrites never hypocrites about anything and I think a lot of people I talk to who struggle in their relationships with their children when they explain things like they're very hypocritical like they're telling their children one thing over here and then they're doing something totally different over here and I'm telling them well that's I don't even respect you and you're just telling me the story. So I know your kid's not gonna respect you. Like you gotta be consistent. Like Shakura said, you got to be consistent. That's a key point. Cause like Kwame Ture said, if you if people aren't consistent, we don't have to deal with them. And that's what's happening for a lot of people. Your kids aren't dealing with you cause you're not consistent. And then you have to be willing and able to create a healthy environment where your children are prioritized. And again, you're gonna make errors in this regard because this is not a perfect science. But I think the important thing is that your children see you making the effort. They, the children understand that you're not gonna be perfect 100% of the time. But what is not acceptable is when you're inconsistent in your effort. It's important for your children to see you standing up for them every single time. Even if you have to tell them things they could have done better in the process, it's still important that they see that you are always there for them. It's uncompromising. So this is true. Yeah, you know, we, we wrote letters to the teacher, wrote letters to the teacher, went and talked to the teachers multiple times. And then on the flip side of that, when, um, when there was other kind of support needed, I did that too. You know, when I remember one time when Shakur was in high school, I don't know if you remember this, you were walking the dog in the neighborhood and these two redneck um, Klansmen looking men 
uh, said something to you while you were walking the dog. I don't. Uh, do you remember that? Um, they said something about uh, what's this black girl doing here walking a dog? And you came to the house and told me that. And we immediately went around there and confronted those two dudes. And, you know, you might say, oh, you know, you may not be able to do that the way I did it. And that's totally understandable because, you know, I was going to take both of them dudes out if that, that's what needed to happen. And you may not be able to do that. And that's okay. You don't have, there are many different ways. Like Shakur said, there are many different ways to be creative. But the important thing to me is it was important for me, for her to understand that nothing on this earth is going to happen to her where whoever's causing the problem is not going to have to deal with me. And that's still true today in 2021 and beyond. That's still true. So you have to you have to establish that with your children because once you do that, they know you're down for them. You're not going to have all these problems with honesty and trust in the relationship. You're not going to have the reason why those those problems exist is because you don't you haven't established that kind of that type of relationship has not been established. Some of us have never established that type of connection with any human beings. And so you have to look at that and start thinking about how can I put that in place? Because once you have that level of communication, interaction, then trust is not going to be a problem. And then once trust is not a problem, then it, there's no limit to what you can do to build and move forward. Okay. And then you have to develop whatever processes you develop, you stick to it. Like Shakur talked about, and you might think it's silly, but it was very important to us. Um, when we talked about you were not going home, we wanted to instill a value. This is not your home. This is the home of the indigenous people of the Western hemisphere. My concern with that is if she's saying, well, I'm going home, even on an unconscious level, I know a lot of you say that. Listening right now, I'm, I'm thinking getting ready to go home. Every time you say that, you're, what you're doing is you're saying, this is your land. It's not the indigenous people's land. That's what you're saying. Whether you mean to or not is irrelevant. That's what you're saying. And I didn't want her to say that. I didn't want her to believe that. So yeah, we were very militant. You can say dogmatic, you can say whatever you want, but it was like, yeah, this is your home? Well, I'll be free at two o'clock. Oh, how you gonna get free? You should let the rest of us know so we can be free. You know, we were very consistent with that kind of language in the AAPRP. That's how we talk. And some people might, you know, they might say, well, uh, that, that doesn't really accomplish anything. Well, I, I beg to differ. It accomplishes a lot because what it did for me when I was young is it helped me establish a foundation for my values. And then as I was raising this wonderful young woman, it helped reinforce that with her. So whatever processes you implement, have them be consistent. If you say people are more important than money, you got to be consistent with that. You can't just say that and then engage in practices where you're hustling people, manipulating people, your children see that, you're not going to have any credibility. You got to be consistent with your processes and you got to stick to them. And you have to have expectations of your child. But you can't have expectations if you don't deliver on what you're supposed to do. You got to be making sure you're doing what you're supposed to do as a parent. And then that sets you up in a position where you can establish expectations of the child. And then if you have that, then all these other things that are so problematic are much less of an issue. Discipline and studying, but well, you have to set up an environment. So your child has, has an expectation that they're going to be expected to study not play video games all day, not watch television all day, not hang out with their friends all day, but have a process. Like Shakur always saw us reading, always saw us reading. She never saw us, and I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just saying, I'm just telling you, this is the environment she grew up in. Nobody was playing video games. Nobody was getting high. Nobody was getting drunk. Nobody was talking crazy to each other. No, she, she didn't grow up with any of that. And so, that was an objective of mine was to create an environment because I grew up with all of that. <laughs> okay, I grew up with all of that every day. And so I, I didn't want to have that reinforced with my children, with my child. So I made some decisions and I set in motion some processes to ensure that that didn't happen. And I remember one time we were going to a party, friend's party, um, and we went to the supermarket and they, they, they told me they wanted me to get some wine. 
to bring to the party. And, you know, we don't, we don't drink, but um, I got the wine because that's what they said they wanted. And so I had the wine in the basket in the supermarket and Shakur was all freaked out. And I'm like, well, what is wrong with you? And she, you're an alcoholic. She's a little girl, right? But, and I, I'm like, what? what is she talking about? But then I realized she had never seen that before. <laughs> so for her, so then we had to have a conversation. And I explained to her, adults drink adult beverages. Just I just make the decision not to do it. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. You know, you will see people doing that and they will do that. And that's fine as long as they maintain, you know, control over their atmosphere, that's, they have a right to do that. And so we talked about that. So to this day, you know, she's made the decision to, to do this the same as her mother and I, not to drink, not to get high, but she is just like us. Like I, I'm around people drinking all, I don't have any disrespect for it, but you have to establish your processes and you have to be willing to talk about it so that your children understand what's going on. That's the point there. And again, like Shakur said, you got to develop consistency. You're not going to be perfect, but you got to ensure that that effort is consistent. That's the thing. And so here we have a picture. Shakur was, I think, three or four with Kwame Ture. And one of the many times he came through that we were facilitating his speaking engagements. This was 1990, this picture was taken, if my memory serves me correct. And so more keys to remember is like Shakur said, y'all, you got to tell your children the truth. You can't have all these white people coming in their house, saving them. Santa Claus, Tooth Fairy, you can't, you can't have that. You, because when you allow, when you lie to your children about that stuff, you, you, are, you are the chief administer of the education of white supremacy in their lives. You can't, you can't, you got to tell them the truth. You got to tell your kids the truth. They are not going to be stunted because you tell them the truth. They're actually gonna be stunned when you lie to them with all that, that nonsense. So you gotta tell them the truth about what this system is. Now for us, that was that this system, again, US history in 10 seconds. Some pimps from Europe stole us from Africa, brought us here and built an empire, stole the indigenous land, built an empire. That's, that's how we raised our, our daughter, period. That's the truth. So no, no, we don't respect anything about this institution. The police, no, we don't respect no police. The police are security guards for, for the super rich. That's all they are. The military, no, we don't respect that. They're, they're super guards, security guards for the super rich. That's all they are. All this, every institution in this society is built on our backs and designed to oppress humanity. And if you don't have the courage to teach your children that, you shouldn't have children. I'm sorry, you shouldn't. You're not qualified to do it because you're putting your children in danger by lying to them about this vicious beast that you're setting them loose to exist in in this backward society without preparing them for how to deal with the beast. You got to do that. That's not an option. That's not extracurricular. That's a fundamental requirement of raising children in this society, you got to tell them the truth. And in order for you to tell them the truth, you got to know the truth. So that means you have to be engaged. This child has never known me not in organization. I've been in the organization I'm in now the whole time she's been on earth. And she's seen that, but she's, I hope that she's also been able to see, well, you know, he can balance that with me and put me up there and take care of my needs. And then he does that. And so it's not a competition, you know, cause some of our activists have, they've been all movement and no, they didn't do anything to raise their children. And I don't think that's right either. And I learned from the people I admired. I learned from Malcolm. I did, I, I, when he was killed and there was nothing for his family, I paid attention to that when I was 17. I'm like, when I have a family, I don't want that to be the case. You know, so it's nothing wrong with that. Like David Brothers, who was one of our elders in the AAPRP, the, one of the founders of the Brooklyn Black Panther Party chapter, he used to come out here. And uh, one time he was here and people were making fun of me because I had to leave the work because I had to go to work. Shakur was a baby and I had a job, you know, I had a family to support. So I had to go to work and I couldn't do any of the party work anymore. And people were making fun of you going, you working for the white man, blah, blah, blah. And I, I was like 25 at the time. So I was really, it really upset me, you know, and I was upset and he saw that. And he told me, brother, you, uh, he told me the story of how he was a welder. He worked for all these years as a welder and he retired and he had a pension. 
And he told me, that's how I'm able to be out here right now, working with you right now. And he told me the story about when he was in the Black Panther Party and Huey P. Newton got out of jail and went to New York. And um, he was working as a welder. And um, Huey was telling him, how could you be working for the man and fighting for the people? And then, you know, this time he's telling me this and then he telling me, now look today, look at me, this how David Brothers used to talk. Look at me today, brother, look at me today. I'm here with you, where is Huey now? Where is Huey now? So, I mean, it's like, I, I learned from that, right? Like that's, okay, you have to have credibility. And I can't be, I didn't want to be one of these people talking about the system, the system, da, 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 and then I'm, I, I can't keep a job. I can't, you know, I, it was important to me to be able to, not because I like slavery, but I didn't want no, I've never wanted anybody telling me what to do. And I never want anybody telling me what to do in my family, that's for sure. So I wanted to make sure Shakur, Shakur can tell you every job I've had, if the people got on the line, I'd tell them in a minute to go to hell because I always was able to make sure I had resources to do that. And that was important to me because I wanted her to understand that and get that in her psychology. Like, don't be a slave for these people. You stand up all the time against them. So that's important to do that. And then obviously, you know, you're living your life based on the collective humanist and egalitarian principles that you should be for justice, then that's going to come through and how you interact with your children. It most certainly will come through. And so, you know, again, the important point is you got to be involved in the struggle. And I'm talking about in terms of organized work. If all you're doing is going to the slave master every day and coming to the house and turning on the TV, you can't talk to your kids about standing up for justice because they may not say it to you, but if that was me, I'd be like, the only thing you stand up to do is change the channel. You know, so you gotta, you have to be, you have to be a living example of what you're saying. And if you're not doing that, you gotta honestly look at that. That might be part of the problem if you're having a problem. So join organizations. We would like to encourage you to join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. You go to the website there, middle left of the screen, aprp-intl.org, and you see a little orientation video, you get more information, do that. You can go to a betterworld.me underneath that. That's my blog site. It has all of these videos of these workshops there housed over the last year plus. So you can look at any one of them. Check them out. So do that. Let people know. I'm on the editorial collective for the Hood Communist Collective. Hoodcommunist.org. Check that out. Um, wonderful group of revolutionaries. I wrote an article that's posted there this week on this man, Umar Johnson. And stop calling him a Pan-Africanist because I am I know what a Pan-Africanist is. And, and that is not what he represents. So check that out encourage you to do that. We have a number of these broadcasts happening, the Pantula broadcasts on Mondays, 6 p.m. Eastern time, Forward Ever broadcast on Saturdays, Revolutionary Action Women from our comrades in Southern Cali, get on that one. Our comrades in New Mexico, the newscast, 11 a.m. Mountain Time every Thursday on your Samu and Monica, check that out. They are off the hinges, all of them are. Evan, Jamila, um, there in the East Coast, um, all of our comrades there, uh, Halimatu in Missouri there and Raw, check all of them out. They're off the chain. And then next Sunday, we want to ask you to come back. You're not going to want to miss this one. The 13th, we're going to be talking about Zionist Israel and its consistent sabotage in Africa. What is the history of Zionist Israel in Africa? We want to talk about how the one of the main methodologies the Zionists have been able to use to oppress the Palestinian people has been their reliance on exploiting Africa. And that's what we have to put a stop to. So we want you to join us. Please spread the word. Bring a pen and pad. It's going to be extremely educational. And then we want to invite you. You're doing it. We appreciate it. To continue to buy my book. A Guide for Organizing Defense Against White Supremacists, Patriarchal and Fascist Violence. I have not spent a nickel in advertising and the book is selling it, and this is good. People, I'm talking to people every day 
about, hey, we got this, we're reading it, we want to organize, we want to see if we could, if you could give us a workshop to make sure, you know, we're on what we were seeing what you wanted to talk about. And I'm doing those. I this is what I said I wanted, and it's happening, and I am extremely busy doing that, and I have zero complaints. I'm proud and honored to do this work. So we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for coming. Again, join us next week. Zionist Israel and its consistent sabotage in Africa. We will see you next week. Join those other podcasts. Go to those other information services. They are all outstanding. Forward ever. Backwards never. Always stay clever in any endeavor. Smash white supremacy. Smash patriarchy. And capitalism. Y'all know it's got to go. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your Sunday afternoon. Shakura, appreciate everything you said. Talk to you soon. Forward ever. <laughs>